Coming up on Digital Music Trends 186, recorded on the 4th of June 2014, Beats finally turns into Apple's Beats. The independent labels take action against YouTube by filing a complaint to the European Commission. Universal Music files motions to end the class action suit on digital royalties. Amazon could be preparing an on-demand music service for Prime. International efforts to block mega uploads access to cash in New Zealand and Hong Kong continue. The Department of Justice will review asking up and BMI's consent decree and the StubHub launches a new music focus, the ticketing app. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many, many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly newsletter on what's happening at DMT, you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list. And don't forget that DMT needs your feedback. So if you have any, uh, do tweet on at Trends, and I'm sure I'll get back to you. And this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, to the show two great guests uh, to real heavyweights of the US uh, music industry press and it's great to welcome back Ben Cesario from New York from the New York Times uh, so hi Ben and thanks for joining us how's it going hi just want to say that was some very impressively fast uh, boilerplate talking. That was like one of those uh, <laughs> radio ads where they talk all of the disclosures at the end. That exactly. Was this is. A, I just want to get to the to the to the bulk of it because we have so many news to cover, and uh, it's also a real pleasure to welcome for the first time on the show Eric Gardner, a senior editor at the Hollywood Reporter. So hi, Eric, and thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. And uh, I've been a, a, a big fan of your uh, pieces as well for a long time, so it's great to have you here for the first time as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I am going uh, to cha- start uh, today by chatting about, uh, of course, the uh, Beats Music and Apple story. So it's a really good job that I got you guys on the show today because there's quite a few uh, US-centric stories uh, going on, and I look forward to hearing your take. Hopefully it's the last time that I open the show with the Beats Music and Apple story because I'm totally sick of it. Uh, but uh, we have to talk about it because uh, last week I was fairly unlucky in that that uh, uh, the, the the actual news broke about five hours after we recorded the show last Wednesday. Uh, so uh, we had some of the facts uh, correct uh, from the New York Post. I think they had some leaks uh, as to uh, what the, the, figure, the ballpark figure of the acquisition was. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's great to actually have a few days to kind of sit down and think about it and, and read what other people are, 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 are saying around the acquisition. So uh, facts-wise, for anybody that hasn't been keeping up to date, the acquisition was for $3 billion, and uh, that was uh, $2.5 billion for Beats Electronics and 500 million from Beats for Beats Music and uh, Dr. Dre and Jimmy uh, Iovine will join Apple uh, and uh, so will apparently uh, Trent Reznor and uh, uh, Ian Rogers uh, according to the latest reports. Uh, Beats operations will continue for Beats Music as they are. Uh, there was actually a slight discount on the service uh, since the acquisition so it's $100 for a year instead of 120 and so uh, you know not a great deal of news, but uh, it kind of it really feels like it's something that Apple, Apple has thought through at this point and had the time to actually look at this acquisition. But uh, I want to hear your take. So, Eric, on, on, on your side, what do you think about the acquisition and the role that uh, Iovine in particular can, can play at Apple? Well, I think uh, he's very important to the deal. I don't know whether Apple has a, a destination per se. I, I think that they, they see a direction they're going uh, towards with with the acquisition of Beats and 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 getting a Jimmy Iovine on board, uh, streaming obviously is is important to the future as as less and less people uh, buy digital music. I also don't think though that the the headphones uh, business is to be discounted. I think that uh, wearable computers and um, and the stuff announced by Apple this week in terms of home computing uh, is, is quite interesting and important. And having Iovine and and the whole uh, Beats uh, group uh, may facilitate uh, conversations with with uh, content producers and help them gain rights to to uh, launch uh, products. And you know, I, I think people are. are Putting too much emphasis on, on what the evaluate uh, what the valuation of the of the company is, uh, and not really spending as much time thinking about the future and, and the direction. I think uh, you know Apple probably sees Beats in the category of a brand. They 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 probably see them as as Nike in the 90s. Um, they they're cool. They're hip. 
um, and they they have the right uh, personnel and relationships, and that's where they're going. And a, a much more affordable price tag as well than Nike in the 90s. And, uh, and uh, Ben, on your side, you, you wrote a fantastic uh, piece on uh, this whole story, and especially focusing on uh, Iovine. So what do you make of the executive joining Apple, leaving Universal uh, for good, uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, making, a, making a mark on the company now? Well, it, it's potentially really huge about what Jimmy Iovine could be doing at Apple, um, what he, you know, what kind of role he will have there. They, you know, they're known for this very kind of buttoned down, um, uh, you know, strict culture in which people sort of follow the party line. Um, in the uh, WWDC the other day, it was it was interesting to see. Um, the one executive, Craig uh, Federicier, I apologize, I forget his name. Yeah. You know, he had That's sort right. of more personality than most, but even so, that wasn't really all that much yeah. personality. <laughs> um, I mean, I, in a way, I was a little disappointed about the announcement of the Beats deal from Apple because really there's no more to it that they announced than everybody was able to guess in the first 24 hours anyway. Yeah. And that's because there's really, they didn't say anything. Um, you know, they're buying the company. We know it's a valuable brand and it's a valuable headphone company and they have this fledgling music service. Um, they're getting Jimmy Iovine, they're getting Dr. Dre, two big figures, but what are they going to do? Um, what does it mean for iTunes customers? Are there going to be multiple brands you know, is there going to be a Beats B somewhere in the iTunes ecosystem competing for your eyeball? Are they going to, you know, are they are they going to have some new wearable product? Like we don't know. They didn't say yeah. anything. Yeah. So, uh, and it, I think it's 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 still true as you know in the in the first twenty four hours, everybody was scratching their heads about this, saying, you know, they could have built a digital music service and two weeks if, if they wanted to do it um, they could have gotten somebody to make some cool headphones you know like they, they, there's not a lot that they couldn't have built in house other than to immediately grab the cool factor and uh and, and sort of some of the goodwill that you get when you have people like Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine there so yeah. it, it sounds like a high price to pay just for those names uh, and just for finally getting on board with subscription streaming music which they're three late three years late to at this point but um yeah. you know I, I, I it's apple they do everything very very well they may surprise us who knows what they'll come up with but yeah i i remember just walking out of there and just thinking like they didn't tell us anything you know what are they what are they going to do yeah, and it's uh, yeah, no, you're completely right. Well, they haven't. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they figured it out. Actually, you know, the, the rumors are, are that the, the you know the the initial leak uh, was way too early in the negotiations, and that's why it, it took so long to, to for it to be confirmed. And so maybe Apple Apple themselves were just interested in the company. And actually, the rumors spread way too fast before it was all finalized. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about was the fact that Universal is actually going to make a bit of a killing out of this acquisition, uh, around four hundred million dollars. I think the share they had was about fourteen percent of, of of Beats. Uh, and so I was wondering. Uh, you know, what do you think about this? And do you think that this might spur labels to become a bit more adventurous when it comes to investing in new tech companies and branching out? You know, they're already doing so in, to a certain extent, but maybe this big payday might spur them to start investing a bit more heavily in, into uh, tech companies and see how that pans out for them. You know, that's one of the interesting uh, underreported aspects of a lot of these deals. I mean, the labels actually had a, a small piece in YouTube as well, uh, a lot of people uh, forget, and it, which has come up in some of the lawsuits because, uh, you know, some of the artists don't think that they got any, anything from, from the YouTube stake. But, um, I, you know, I, I, it's hard for me to, to see them becoming venture capitalists. But in terms of making deals, uh, uh, rights deals, uh, you know, why not? Uh, you know, it, it, if they can they can get a piece of these companies and uh and and certainly uh you know beats shows that that it can be worth it uh they'll try to do that i, I don't think it's a it, it's a important uh factor at the, at this point it, it, it they're not going to uh you know shake up their business or 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 decide that that um the the pennies they get per song uh per stream uh, is is uh, less important than their percentage of equity but uh they'll, they'll certainly their lawyers will certainly certainly ask for it when doing deals yeah 
Yeah, sure. And uh, uh, Ben, what do you what do you make of uh, WWDC? Uh, Apple finally announced the Shazam integration on iOS eight, but it's kind of you flew under the radar. It was kind of announced as one of the fe- new features of Siri. Do, do you think that's still like a fairly big thing for Shazam, or is it now just a nice to have thing? But it doesn't look like it's going to be anything more than that. I'm not sure what to make of it, but I, I want to stick on the equity yeah, sure, of course. question because I ahead. think that's I think it's really important, and um, I don't think it's a new thing. I mean, like this has been part of the way that the labels have been doing digital deals for quite a while now. Yeah, and basically this is a pound of flesh that they demand from uh, pretty much anybody who will give it to them. You know, they can't get it out of Google at this point. They can't get it out of Apple, of course, but. Every every Spotify down the block is going to have to give up equity in order to get these deals done. Um, and uh, there are two ways to look at that. I mean, one is the, hey, we're all partners here. You do well, I do well. Um, but there re- there is a very serious concern, especially among the artists, um, that this is a conflict of interest. And that uh, if the labels are able to get an equity stake and therefore... Uh, make money from sale, um, collect other dividends that would be paid to owners that would not be collected uh, on royalties. That that would that then that would that would allow labels to accept a lower royalty rate than they would otherwise. Yeah. Because if you can make five hundred million dollars on the sale of the company, then a hundredth of a penny doesn't really make much difference to you. Um, it does make a big difference if you are a musician, um, and all you're ever going to get is that hundredth of a penny. Um, and if if we're talking about the difference between whether you make, you know, point oh oh five cents per download or point oh oh seven five cents for download, or I'm sorry, per stream, of course. Um, you know, this this is what it's all about. This is yeah. this is the way that the money is going to be flowing in the future, and. Um, those little tiny fractions of pennies really add up. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what will happen about this. You know, what if if you are a musician, what can you really do to change it? But um, I think this is a really serious issue that is is not going to bowl over. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, you're absolutely right in the sense that uh, I was actually hope I, I was thinking when I, when I when this first came out that we might see some lawsuits come out of it for the first time, or you know, because of your universal stake in uh, Beats. But I don't I don't believe that's a stake that was given out of uh, uh, an equity that was given for the licensing of catalog. Uh, so I don't think that we're going to see that coming up for this uh, time around. But I'm really interested in seeing what will happen when Spotify IPOs uh, and that equity becomes you know something that the the labels ca- can cash out cash out on and, and what. Yeah, I don't think will that do out, of, out of that. Yeah, I don't think that Universal got its stake for licensing catalog. No, exactly. I think it got it got its stake for essentially licensing Jimmy Iovine. Yeah. That you know they're they're paying him. Universal was paying him a salary while on the side he had this other gig, and I I, I believe the deal there was okay. You can go pursue your your side gig, but you have to give us a chunk of it. Yeah. So the big task um, is still going to be Spotify at this point to see how. Artists that are signed to majors react to the IPO when a Sony cashes out their their three or four percent or five percent. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, and uh, and so uh, um, I wanted to actually talk about uh, where you touched about um, our, um, on YouTube uh, for uh, a second there, and I wanted to mention a developing story actually that has been take, taking shape over the last few hours. Uh, so listeners uh, will recall uh, that last week we talked about the worldwide independent music networks' statements against YouTube, uh, you know, against YouTube's static tactics, especially in gaining streaming licenses from independent labels, uh, uh, where YouTube is reportedly uh, telling labels that either they give uh, uh, them the license for the streaming service at a much lower rate than what uh, Spotify, for example, pays, uh, or uh, they cannot have their content on YouTube at all, including the videos, which is a really big, uh, uh, big step for them. And uh, in the past few hours, Impala, which is a pan-European independent music organization that uh, you know uh, looks after independent labels, uh, has announced that it will file a complaint, w- a complaint with the European Commission. And they actually had a press conference here in London just a couple of hours ago, uh, where they outlined uh, uh, you know the issues that they see with YouTube uh, taking the stance and the fact that uh, uh, you know. They haven't withdrawn their demands since the statement last week, and so it leaves them little option but to actually go uh, via an official route with Europe that has usually been fairly understanding of uh, these kind of issues and uh, fairly uh, strict on on, uh, perceived monopolies. And uh, we're going to have to see how this shakes out. So, uh, Eric, how do you feel about this? Do you think that uh, YouTube is is, uh, picking up a bit of a 
a bigger fight than maybe it expected with the European Commission and that mm. maybe could cause uh, Google other troubles other than those strictly music related? I, I think that the EU takes competition very seriously and uh, Google has been punished over the years for, for various things and, and they have to take this uh, incredibly seriously. Seriously, This is a, you know, a prime um, something to be settled. Uh, you know, I, I have a hard time believing that this is going to make it all the way to judgment. Um, but, you know, I think in the next few months, uh, you know, it, 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 this is this is going to be something to, something to watch. Uh, they, you know, a lot of uh, music companies have been in court in, in America uh, over over YouTube, uh, over over rights. And, and uh, you know, now now over in Europe, uh, I think that uh, this is something that has to concern Google. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, Ben, for, from your side, do you feel like, uh, you know, in, in the US, for example, uh, independent labels uh, are able to uh, have similar processes uh, uh, to complain if, if YouTube uh, was to develop, you know, deploy as, as it is the same tactics? Of course, uh, Europeans are quite sheltered in that because the Euro European Commission has always been quite uh, strong. Uh, but in the US, for example, when we saw the, the universal EMI merger, there were far less constraints put on universal than in Europe. So how do you see that shaking out in North America? They do have avenues for complaint, and I believe that uh, they're complaining to the FTC, right. the Federal Trade Commission. Um, but, I mean, as Eric just said, uh, you know, Europe is very strong in this area. Um, the European regulators, and I'm, I'm no expert on that, but they do tend to look very carefully at the competition question uh, between uh, companies doing business. In America, the concern is often the effect on consumers yeah. and on prices or choice uh, with consumers. And, and in this case, you know, it's not always clear. I mean, if, it, if it's resulting in Google... Um, you know, taking a bunch of music down so that, uh, you know, the labels can't put up their videos and that means that people can't watch them, that might be a trigger. That's something that, you know, that's something that will get their attention. Um, I agree with Eric, though, that um, it's hard to imagine that this really goes super far, but it's it's bad press for Google. And, you know, it does kind of dovetail uh, into what's going on with Amazon right now, yeah. with the way they've been bullying um, Hachette. Um, and, and this is kind of, um, just to take a step back from it, about these specific complaints, you know, th this is the kind of thing that, you know, consumer groups um, have been worried about for a long time. And we're starting to see this world where the Internet basically has a few giant powers um, that if they want to, you know, can sort of bully people in or out of the market. Um, and if that's what's going on here and, and if there's no recourse for it, it's it's really terrifying just to think that, you know, um, your, your YouTube, um, you've got, you know, half of the eyeballs on the planet. If you don't like the way negotiations are going with somebody, you can just murder them. Yeah. Um, and if you're Amazon and you want some more points on the – digital deal with a publisher all of a sudden you know malcolm gladwell's books are no longer available uh, on on this hugely important uh, marketplace so yeah. you know just the whole thing is really scary and um I, I mean i'm impressed by the organization that we've seen from the independent labels um they were quite loud in the universal emi deal um the Warner Music Group was doing a lot of lobbying behind the scenes, um, but we would expect them to be sort of well capitalized and pretty organized. But you know, the indie labels are this disparate group of you know thousands of labels. Some of them are pretty major companies, like say Beggars, which yeah. has you know XL, and they have a Dell, and you know um, they're they're almost like a mini major label. And then you've got all kinds of just like you know a label that. Uh, some dude runs out of his bedroom and and you know and that's the way it works but um th there's there's a lot of trade groups um that i think that sector um communicates uh among themselves very well yeah i think they're used to this kind of thing so um it's just interesting to see that some well-organized opposition 
really does know how to kind of you know throw an egg um, when they want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and uh, of course, uh, um, I wanted to also uh, remark on the fact that it's not just uh, you know YouTube uh, in the UK, for example. It's it's an important part of, of revenues uh, on the digital side, but it's not uh, the the core uh, revenue stream for uh, uh, for digital. Uh, one of the interesting things I was talking to uh, a panel of uh, 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 people from the Brazilian music industry for a show that I'm releasing next week as a sort of a pre World Cup special um, with uh, the head of the independent music uh, um, association in Brazil and the head of Som Libre uh, and uh, they were talking about the fact that actually YouTube in Brazil is uh, the uh, core sort of one of uh, the, the staple of streaming revenues because uh, the other services are still very small and YouTube was, was the one service that was freely accessible and the people didn't have to pay up front for so for them it's even harder to figure out how to deal with this because of course they don't want to uh, you know, and the relationship with, with YouTube because that's such an important part of their digital uh, economy for the, for, for the music side of things. But at the same time, they don't want to give in to the, dem the demands of, of, of Google. So at the same time, so, uh, you know, I think that they're having a very hard time with it, maybe even harder than, than uh, the labels here in the UK. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, moving on to this, you mentioned Amazon, uh, we, and that's actually the next story, so that's great. Uh, so uh, that's another, yet another company that's moving into the space. Uh, uh, so uh, we, um, I'm sure that uh, you know, all, all consumers are wondering is when a new music streaming player is going to come onto into the world, and because uh, <laughs> we don't have enough. And uh, uh, but Amazon has been reported uh, by BuzzFeed of all things. I, I, that's the first time I, I believe that's the first time I, I can say that a music industry story has been broken by BuzzFeed. But uh, uh, they are reporting that uh, um, Amazon is uh, planning to launch a music streaming service as part of their Prime offering. So it's going to be free as part of the Prime subscription, which has, I believe is $99 in the US, uh, I think now. It's, it's gone up. Yeah, it just went up. Yeah. And uh, um, the twist here, though, is that Prime, um, the Prime Music subscription, won't uh, contain, according to BuzzFeed Music, from the last six months. So it will only have music that is six months old or older, uh, which uh, makes it kind of a similar proposition to what... Uh, you know, Amazon Instant or, or Netflix uh, give on the video side, but uh, on a very, very different market where a lot of people are actually keen on streaming the latest radio hits. So uh, I don't know, uh, Eric, do you think that, that there is some truth in these, in these reports and would consumers actually care about a service that doesn't provide access to any of the radio friendly hits that they are, they're used to or, or they want to hear? Well, I'm only speculating here, but I don't think that the purpose of the Amazon's new uh, service is to attract uh, people uh, attract new customers. Right. I think it's it's more for the loyalty uh, of uh, of their existing customers. They've just raised prices, and, and maybe they just want to and do an add on feature. Right. And, and the way that they're you know doing this is by trying to acquire rights in the cheapest way possible. And the way to do that is not to do the the recent new hits, but but uh, you know uh, uh, get buy buy some some of the older cheaper ones. Uh, and, and then just add it on to add it onto the service. Um, it, it, the the market is almost saturated now with with streaming uh, services, um, and and it's 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 hard to to uh, say that that Amazon really has designs to to be the new Spotify. Um, you know, I, th I think what they're doing mainly is just you know throwing uh, you know an egg out there and and, and hoping that it cooks. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 you know I. I don't know anyone who's who's really going to be signing up for uh, a, a service that 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 really is is inferior to to a lot of other platforms out there, and ch and uh, obviously uh, it's it's not very uh, cheap if you're if you're um, not if you're only interested in the music, yeah, um, you know, because then you're spending ninety nine dollars for for music when you know there's so many other services that could do it. Um, uh, less. I think it, it's m mainly just another feature to package in, in, into the overall Prime experience. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, Ben, I was actually thinking just right now about the fact that uh, the Firebox has universal search. So maybe that's a play. You know, people are searching for an artist and and the Amazon Prime service comes up. Maybe that's, that's an incentive. Maybe. Um, I, I do think it's it's interesting to think about this in terms of kind of segments of the marketplace. Um, one of the things that often gets said about, say, Spotify or, or Beats um, is that 
they're really hashing it out over a pretty small layer of big music fans who are the people who are willing to pay 10 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year, you know, thereabouts. And um, as has been pointed out many, many times, the average Joe consumer walking around in a shopping mall somewhere um, is more likely to spend maybe 40 bucks a year. You know, they're going to they're gonna buy one or two CDs or they're going to do a few downloads. Um, but the, you know, the, as these services, um, you know, proliferate and they really hash out that tiny sliver of the marketplace of big fans who are actually willing to spend more than $100 a year, they're going to have to start turning to the ordinary people, yep. the moms and dads and the cousins and, you know, the people who, you know, they want to spend a few bucks, maybe. Um, these are the people who listen to Pandora. Um, and Pandora is just fine with them. And they, you know, there's 75, 76 million people every month or whatever the number is um, that use Pandora all the time. And so you, you do have to wonder um, – of all the sort of ordinary consumers out there, maybe some of them will be satisfied by what Amazon is doing. And Amazon really has the power to just sort of put this in front of people in a way that most other, you know, Spotify can't do that. Um, whereas Amazon is probably reaching almost every single consumer on the Internet all the time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's I, we're just, you know, throwing around ideas here. But, I mean, it's, sure. it seems conceivable that, hey, maybe... Maybe Amazon getting in this and giving people just a little bit of the digital music would be enough to prevent them from spending the 10 bucks a month to go to Beats or to go to Spotify or to go to RDO or any of the, you know, Schmartio, any, any of the other ones. Um, so I don't know. I, that, that's what I thought of when this first started cooking. And this is, um, I mean, not to take any, anything away from BuzzFeed, but this has been sort of chatted about, and there have been some leaks yeah. you know, for quite a while now that Amazon's up to something. Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the industry press, a lot of the, con the concern and the reporting has been more like, what are the terms that Amazon has been offering the labels and the publishers? And uh, the, the reports are that they're deadly squat. And so people didn't want to sign the contracts. But, you know, that's going to get hashed out. But I, I think, like, ultimately what this is about is getting people to sign up and yeah. whether, whether consumers are going to care. And th that, that's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, actually, a quick uh, uh, sort of uh, parenthesis uh, on that is that uh, talking about companies that want people to sign up, uh, Spotify has just uh, announced a, a, a special offer for the summer, uh, which uh, uh, I think is going to last for the next 10 days, uh, which allows people uh, both in the UK and in the US, uh, I've, I've tested both, I'm not sure if it works in other parts of the world, to get access to Spotify for three months uh, if they are uh, new to the premium subscription for uh, uh, just uh, paying just for one month. So it's a uh, uh, Three for one, uh, an interesting offer. Uh, I guess uh, they want to counter a Beats discount of twenty dollars, and that's kind of that kind of matches it. So just wanted to throw that in there in case people. These seem like I mean, these seem like pretty minor yeah. discounts, don't they? I mean, exactly. th these seem like you know, five percent off every other Tuesday on your second beer or something. Like I, I, I don't think any of those things are really going to get large numbers of people to spend their money. But yeah. that's the best they can do because they have serious licensing costs. I mean, I guess. Uh, does it, does, sorry, go does ahead. it include uh, Does it include Malcolm Gladwell on tape? I'm just curious. <laughs> 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 we'll have to see. Yeah, I guess like Spotify framed it a bit better because you know it's a summer thing. People maybe are traveling. They want to take the music with them. They want to cash it on their phone, and maybe that might convince them to do it for a one-off, uh, ten bucks uh, for three months and see how that works out. Uh, but yeah, for the Beats thing, you know, twenty bucks on on a year, it's not really something that is going to convince them people to really shell out a hundred bucks like that uh, and subscribe. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the Kim.com saga continues. We've been talking about it for a few months, uh, for for a few years actually on. On DMT, and uh, I will spare you the details of the latest developments. But essentially, there's a very real possibility that, uh, due to the various technicalities of the various lawsuits that are going on around the world, uh, Kim.com may be gaining access to uh, part of his uh, frozen assets, uh, especially the ones in New Zealand and Hong Kong. So, the, both the US uh, uh, movie studios and record companies have in a fit about this because uh, that means that uh, uh, Kim.com would have access to actually a lot of money to, uh, uh, you know, pump up his uh, legal defense in the US case, uh, which is uh, uh, the big one. And so, uh, you know, Eric, I know you talked to the lawyers of Mega Upload. And so uh, how are they taking this? And w w what's your take on what's going on here and, and sort of the behind the scenes uh, maneuverings to make sure that uh, Kim.com doesn't get his money back? 
Well, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, it, it can't have been unexpected. Kim.com's team has been working for, for you know, ever since the indictment came down to free up uh, uh, the assets. Um, you know, what's been new uh, is, is in the last couple of months, the it was, uh, um, you know, a, a, a motion in, in Hong Kong court and uh, the judges, uh, the trial court judges uh, ruling in New Zealand. And, uh, you know, this, this trial judge in, in New Zealand really seems to favor uh, Kim.com. The, the appeals courts in, in New Zealand, not so much. Yeah. Um, but but they they've certainly experienced some some su- success there. Um, just yesterday, uh, the uh, the re- the record company has actually joined um, the uh, the MPAA in a lawsuit in in New Zealand uh, on on this assets front. Uh, you know, trying trying as best they can to to t- tie up the the money. I, and what it all comes down to is is this is a whole complicated process. Obviously, you're dealing with uh, multiple jurisdictions and and extradition. And when you're dealing with foreign companies, it's it's really hard to uh, perfect service on on a on a foreigner or a foreign company. And the arguments by by Meg Upload is uh, you know the summons never came to them. Uh, and, and so, you know, they, they've, uh, you know, a, a appealed to authorities in foreign countries trying to make the argument that, that uh, the service has, hasn't been done perfectly. And as a result, it's, it's the Justice Department's onus to, to justify why the asset should still be frozen. Uh, and it's a you know a decent argument to make. It, it hasn't it hasn't made a dent in U.S. court. Um, you know, uh, uh, Mega Upload has tried you know repeatedly to uh, you know make the, this sort of summons argument, and the, and the judge has has kind of shrugged it off. Yeah. Um, but but uh, certainly. Uh, you know, foreign authorities are, are more um, susceptible to, to to this sort of thing, because it's not just about mega upload; it's about any company doing business there. Um, you know, if you get sued in U.S. court, um, you know what should be the what should be the standard of of, of holding assets uh, for for a foreign company? Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, it kind of it makes you wonder whether it makes. At this point, how much sense it makes for them to keep as hard as as it are, as they are, are are doing? I don't know. It's it seems like a huge money pit. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, certainly uh, in the last few months, the the uh, the industries have brought a civil lawsuit, and uh, um, I'm sure they hope to collect that 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 same money that's in, that would be going to lawyers at, at certain points. One might ask why they waited s- such a long time. They they could have uh, you know filed this lawsuit you know many years ago, um, but they they finally did uh, because they were uh, approaching statute of limitations, and now now that now that that it, it's gone, they they certainly you know perceive themselves as having a good shot of of you know uh, of win hunt type case where you know uh, they could collect a, an easy hundred million dollars yeah. uh, and, and, and the and the and it's much easier to, to sue on civil grounds than than on criminal grounds they, they don't need to show uh, as, as as much um, mindfulness to to criminal intent as, as the as the prosecutors do yeah. um, they, they just have to show that that um, you know uh, that you know all the takedown notices that they were sending were being ignored or circumvented. Absolutely, and that's uh, that's going to be a very fascinating case to watch uh, unfold uh, for the next few years. I'm sure <laughs> I can't see an end in sight on this one. So I think the MPAA and the RIA are going to have to keep uh, shelling out a lot of money to keep it keep it going. And uh, um, I was going to say I was going to uh, talk about uh, uh, briefly about uh, Universal Music. And so uh, last week I actually mentioned briefly uh, this uh, summary judgment motions that Universal Music filed uh, to end the class action lawsuits around digital royalties in the US but I wanted to look at this a little bit more uh, um, to uh, give a, a bit of a better account on it so uh, Eric you wrote a piece on this and I'm sure Ben you have some thoughts on on this as well so uh, Universal uh, talks about uh, how digital downloads were seen at the time uh, so in its view they were simply an equivalent of a physical sale through a new distribution channel and uh, they actually even go as far as saying that Universal paid artists more than they should have gotten because uh, they uh, didn't deduct uh, packaging of the royalties they gave out uh, on digital 
Universal downloads, and that was uh, very magnanimous of them. And so Universal's motion also goes to challenge some more specific points, uh, such as the claim of violation of California's uh, unfair competition law, because uh, it claims that, uh, as you pointed out uh, earlier, um, there wasn't... Uh, sufficient harm to the public that was being done in that case and also there are other technicalities in s specific artist contracts uh, uh, that make their claims invalid so uh, Ben do you think that uh, uh, you know they uh, have a, a case here to actually uh, you know they have en enough here to start uh, uh, challenging these motions uh, given that uh, other other labels like Univer uh, Sony and uh, Warner have actually paid up uh, for quite a few of these claims and uh, and uh, uh, why do you think they are being so aggressive well, the reason they're being so aggressive is there's a lot of money at stake. Right. Um, but you know, I'm I'm not the the, the legal eagle. That's Eric about um, what their chances are and so forth. Yeah. So I won't venture there, other than just that. Uh, I, I haven't they already lost this fight? Basically, I mean, I, I don't understand what there is left for them to to argue. Uh, how how can they really? Uh, win, win with this argument. Um, I was, I think it was Eric's story about this the other day, uh, which said that um, uh, the the discovery has resulted in something like six hundred and fifty thousand pages of documents. Um, boy, uh, I hope you haven't had to uh, read all of those, Eric. But maybe you could summarize for us, um, you know, what's what's come out in all that disclosure. You know, and, and 650000 uh, is, is interesting because I'm sure that the plaintiffs didn't even get 10% of, of what they wanted. They were pushing for all the record contracts, and the judge denied uh, a lot of that. Um, well, you know, some, some, some of the fight is on technical grounds, but actually I think that the, the technical grounds are, are, are probably the most important here. Um, so, so, yes, a, a federal appeals court has, has said that digital downloads, uh, you know, are, are more like licenses than they are sales but uh two important factors one uh is the factor of whether the plaintiffs brought their claims uh quickly enough this has been talked about for about a decade uh ever since uh, itunes came on to to the scene and uh and, and at the time uh around 2004 uh, a lot of reps for for musicians were starting to make a stink of it and so universal is one of the things that they're saying is that well you could have brought the lawsuit 10 years ago you waited all this time and that's that might be an out for them uh the second thing is that you know a, a lot of these contracts are di are different from each other and and that's a you know a very important consideration not just for for uh, summary judgment, but, but whether the judge certifies a class, right. because there's got to be a commonality between between the plaintiffs, and if all these contracts are disparate, there might not be enough commonality. And if the class action doesn't get certified, that that and then then we're just talking about a, a, a few plaintiffs rather than you know thousands of plaintiffs and yeah. tens of millions of dollars in in damages. So uh, you know those two issues are are, are very important. Uh, and, and you know, it, one of the things that that boggles my mind here is that, is that Warner and Sony and a, you know a couple of others have settled the, these claims, but they haven't settled it for that much. They, I mean, ten million dollars is a lot of money, but um, but uh, you know, considering the fact that this fight has been going on for three years in the court and and it'll probably go on for another two years, that's probably about ten million dollars in litigation costs right there. So, uh, you know, why is Universal be, being so stubborn on this? You know, maybe it's partly leadership. Maybe their contracts are, are more susceptible to these these types of claims. The other thing, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about streaming services. You know, I, in terms of... Uh, of, of of iTunes, there's the issue of whether it's a license or a sale. Yeah. But there's, all, but there, you know, in a case a, a few months ago against Sony, there was the issue of of, of how uh, record uh, labels were accounting for music off of Spotify, you know, whether their their broadcasts or whether their distributions, and a similar issue has come up. Uh, whether whether you know artists are are, are being given fifty percent of of income off of these platforms, or are they being given fifteen percent uh, <laughs> of income? Um, so you know maybe Universal wants to you know. 
put the throw the line in the sand there you know discourage any uh, anyone from suing them you know make sure that they're not an easy tar target for class action pl uh, plaintiff lawyers um, you know th 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 those are my theories at this at this point yeah uh, you know as for what happens now um, you know it was expected that the that the plaintiffs would would respond to Universal but uh, they're right now they're trying to push the judge to consider certification and some and some judging concurrently yeah and universal doesn't want that yeah because so. the, the big issue now is, is if the certification is not given to the class action lawsuit then uh, artists essentially are on their own and so bigger artists might be able to afford uh, uh, carrying on but smaller artists might have to end up, end up by the wayside and not getting any money out of this right yeah absolutely and and certainly universal would love that yeah yeah, and so uh, I wanted to finish uh, uh, the show. Uh, I, I'm kind of, I, I would love to talk about consent decrees, but I think we've been so technical today that I, I, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should skip this. I'm sure that uh, I can link out to a few uh, shows around consent decrees that I've already recorded with uh, a bunch of people uh, over the last year. Uh, and, you know, just for the sake of news, uh, I just have to say that uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, the department, uh, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, is considering a review of the ASCAP and BMI consent decrees, uh, which uh, may or may not uh, vary the conditions by which uh, publishers uh, have to adhere to these uh, uh, um, uh, to these uh, decrees, and also it may mean that, for example, the likes of Sony ATV or Universal may take uh, their digital rights uh, uh, and uh, deal directly uh, for them with the likes of Pandora, and uh, and so you know. Of course, I'm going to leave this there because I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, give people headaches with too much, too many technicalities today. But uh, I want to finish by well, talking. <laughs> I'll just say, yeah, sure, it's no, a big, ahead. it's a big deal. Yeah, um, you know, and it's, it's dry and it's boring and like this is a real esoteric level of legalese, <laughs> um, and it'll make your eyes glaze over. But um, it's a, it's a big deal, and um, there's a lot of money at stake, and there's also just the more general question of how is this whole crazy digital world of ours sort of going to be administered when it comes to songwriting rights? Yeah. Uh, and that's a part of the business that's, you know, it's not as sexy as the recording side usually, and um, it's harder to understand for a layperson, but it's a really big deal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's going to be. Uh, a lot of, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of money and effort that's going to be expended to on, on every side. You know, Pandora has already made a, you know, non-statement statement. Um, I would assume that Google is going to get in there too, because um, this kind of stuff really gets to the heart of a lot of the way, you know, whether whether the government should have a role in any of this or not. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I can't recommend that people. Stay up all night waiting for the latest brief uh, to be filed for this, but you know eventually there's going to be an interesting story to tell. Yeah, but and, and if you are in the U.S., uh, there is actually the DOJ invites interested parties to uh, include songwriters, uh, composers, publishers, licensees, and digital service providers to send commentary. So there is actually a link uh, uh, somewhere on the DOJ website. Uh, I'm sure you can find it where you can file your comments if you are in the U.S. and you want to have a say on this. And you know my, my own personal thing is that that uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, this really goes to the heart of what the role of co collecting society is, uh, is going to be uh, for the next few years right. if, they are, if the consent decree is changed and uh, uh, the publishers are allowed to take part of their rights away and uh, deal for them directly uh, and how that affects also smaller publishers that might not have the same bargaining power uh, as the likes of Sony TV and the MPG. So uh, I don't know, Eric, if you have anything to add on that. Uh, yeah, I I'm quite worried about it, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, I think that the the karaoke industry is uh, is is singing hallelujahs. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, this stuff has been going on for a while, and uh, it's going to continue continue on. Um, but uh, you know, it, there's certainly nothing more complex in the music industry than than, than the consent decrees and, and perform and performance rights, and um, you know, some of the battles in the past couple of years about about uh, you know the digital portion of it and. and and I, I think what the DOJ is really, you know, um, reviewing right now is 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 whether or not, um, you know, there should be a, a freer market or whether we should, you know, continue on this kind of compulsory, you know, uh, you know, group bucket uh, sort of line that we've been doing for the last, you know, few decades. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and we've talked about these issues uh, lots on the show with uh, Paul Fackler, Deborah Newman, uh, Ken Abdo. So uh, listeners can definitely go back in. 
the in the archives of the MT and find more info on uh, what this is all about. <laughs> And uh, uh, finally, a couple of news from the live section, just to uh, from the, from the live sector, just to close the show. Uh, Ticketmaster has agreed a tentative settlement on the class action lawsuit brought by consumers ar ar around the processing and delivery f delivery fees, and this has been going on for ten years or so. Uh, you know, this covers the period from 1999 to 2013, and uh, Ticketmaster is prepared to pay just under 400 million dollars in vouchers uh, for the class action lawsuit, which will cover 50 million customers, so just under eight dollars each, which is not very much at all. And uh, finally. Finally, a secondary ticket site Sub StubHub, part of the eBay group, has released the StubHub Music app in the US, I can't talk anymore, uh, which is a direct competitor of the likes of Songkick and Bands in Town, and the company aims to become a first uh, choice provider in the sense that it wants people to actually go and find gigs and buy tickets directly there instead of going there as a last resort. So uh, guys, anything on the live music sector, uh, you know, do you feel like there's any developments uh, that uh, are making it exciting from, from an innovation point of view, or is it still a bit of a stuck in a rut in a sense? Anybody else uh, like that? <laughs> well, um, those particular things that you mentioned, I don't think those are gigantic deals. Right. Um, I mean, the Ticketmaster thing, that's just a classic uh, you know, consumer protection suit, and ultimately the lawyers are going to make all the money, and you and I are going to get a postcard in the mail and forget about it, and it's not going to make any difference to anybody. Um, sadly, I think that's just... You know, that's just the way this thing works in this country. Um, the StubHub thing is interesting just because StubHub um, obviously uh, has dominated the secondary market. Um, now they face a lot of competition from Ticketmaster and a lot of this sort of other kind of scalper uh, platforms out there. Um, that I mean, the scalper thing has become really an accepted part of the marketplace. But what I think this tells us is that eBay, which owns StubHub – you know, wants to get more into the primary sale of tickets. They they don't want to just be the place that collects their 25% whenever somebody resells it. They want to sell you the ticket or they want to be in there somewhere. Yeah. They, um, uh, they did a deal uh, a month or two ago with the producers of the Book of Mormon on Broadway where they are going to be selling a portion of the uh, sort of like the VIP tickets, not the whole house, but you know the expensive tickets in the front. Yeah. So there's it's sort of an, and it's I think that's being viewed as a kind of experiment of you know will people actually go there to do it? Is it going to change the reputation that it has? Where typically when people think of StubHub, they just think okay that's where I go to get ripped off. Yeah. You know for the tickets I wasn't able to buy on Ticketmaster. Yeah. So um, you know. There's a sort of clash of titans about who's going to own these, you know, these these big ticketing sectors, a primary versus secondary, um, and it comes down to basically Live Nation versus eBay here. Yeah. Um, they've already been going through uh, the state houses throughout the country trying to change legislation, each to their benefit. Um, you know, it, it's um, it's it's pretty big deal, but um, but I think it. I, I don't know what you think about it, Eric, but I mean, it's it's kind of a mess right now, and I, who knows where it's going to end up. Well, I think uh, it's it's I, it's hard to see this as being positive for for consumers. I mean, obviously, competition is, but we have two giants here, and, and um, uh, you know, I don't think it's going to change that much. Uh, you know. Oh, one of the things that 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 struck me in in uh, the StubHub stuff was the, the social uh, media, um, and it, it almost felt like a, a press release out of two thousand and nine. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, interestingly, ESPN um, tried to do some of the stuff that that StubHub uh, is doing now a couple of years ago in the in the sports ticketing realm. In terms of connecting fans and and selling tickets and and, and communicating experiences, and it, it didn't really work out so, so great. I, I I don't see this as 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 a game changer or particularly innovative, but yeah. but may, maybe um, to the extent that that EBA and and Ticketmaster and Live Nate, you know, if they're clashing a little bit more, it could be something to follow. But but uh, you know, I, I'm still waiting for for the real disruptor. 
they're here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, we were talking like, a couple of weeks ago about the fact that even the companies that were seemingly disruptive, like uh, Songcake, has seemed to be a bit stuck in a rut in the last uh, few months. And we're really excited to see if they have something up their sleeve that they're going to release uh, soon. Uh, and uh, I think that's pretty much it for this week. I wanted to uh, really thank you for your time and, uh, of course, ask if there's anything you'd like to plug at all. So, uh, Ben, anything you're on that you'd like to uh, point out or, or, or send people to? Um, I don't really know. I, uh, other than just that, um, I didn't get to say so at the beginning. I'm, I'm a big fan of Eric's work. I think he does a fantastic job and is an a, a absolutely essential read. And so, um, you know, if you've never checked it out, definitely read his column. That's great. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm going to do a plug for you. I, I'm actually a big fan of a new app that the New York Times has released called the new, new, uh, NY Now, uh, which is actually works really well. And I've been uh, using it for the last month. Uh, it provides you with all the headline news and you can subscribe for, I think it's five or six bucks a month and get uh, a, a lots of fantastic content on there uh, um, if you are not able to read uh, the New York Times regularly. Uh, Eric, on, on your side, anything you'd like to plug? Well, but Ben plugged me very well. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you can find uh, my my work at Hollywood Reporter, uh, the, our, our blog, uh, Hollywood Reporter Esquire. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I, I look forward to uh, covering all this, and, and it's certainly going to be an interesting uh, time. Well, again, thanks so much for your time, and thanks so much for tuning into DMT. Next week is going to be a bit of a different show, uh, as uh, I recorded, as I mentioned earlier, a special uh, show on the Brazilian music industry with some of the key players there, and uh, uh, that's going to go live as usual uh, around Thursday next week. So uh, look out for it. It's just uh, it's the day before uh, the World Cup uh, kicks off, so I thought it would be a good thing to have and a good thing to uh, make people more aware of what's going on in the Brazilian music industry, especially as uh, the Olympics. Are just two years away. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time.